under different Buddhist traditions. And the first thing, the first question I would like to ask is whether we can consider that Buddhism represents one unified tradition, or whether it would be more accurate to talk about Buddhisms in the plural. The second question um, is closely related to that, is whether we can identify some central ethical foundation shared uh, across Buddhist tradition, um, if any. And then um, an additional way to problematize this would be to ask how we can bridge the gap between Buddhist and non-Buddhist tradition. And uh, finally, the fourth question I would like us to discuss, discuss if possible, is to what extent um, is there a need to reformulate the Eightfold Path and the implied threefold structure of uh, inside ethical conduct and mental discipline? Uh, because as we know, from early Buddhism to Mahayana, already there was a reshuffling with the six paramitas. Uh, and today, <coughs> many people tend to focus on uh, the, the three dimensions of learning. Uh, I think some of you received a, a handout where you have a recap of, of these, uh, sometimes called the threefold practice that summarize uh, the gist of what the eightfold path uh, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce the first speaker. Um, all of our speakers tonight are widely known figures uh, on the local scene, uh, especially Bishop Eric Matsumoto. Uh, I won't read your whole profile, which is on the handouts. Uh, uh, and you're so famous here that there's really no need to use you. Uh, he represents the Hopa Honganji Mission, uh, which is the, the state's largest Buddhist delegation, um, and um, his activities uh, encompass a large range of things, including uh, he has been speaking on academic as well as non-academic panels, uh, and he is very supportive of all attempts to, uh, to spread the Buddhist teachings to wider audience. So without further ado, uh, please, Bishop Thank you. share a Mahayana perspective uh, which begins with the Eightfold Path and as uh, uh, was mentioned earlier includes the six parameters and then uh, concludes with the Jodo Shin or Shin Buddhist uh, perspective or understanding of what uh, is referred to as great practice uh, and um, I would like to uh, begin by prefacing though before I start that uh, uh, I know I was introduced as the bishop, but, uh, uh, but please ignore that title. Uh, I am mm -hmm. not ordinarily fully speaking. And so with that, <laughs> I'd like to uh, share my presentation. Um, generally speaking, there is no doubt that the Noble Eightfold Path outlines in a very clear and easily understandable way what should happen for the realization of enlightenment. Uh, and though not to be taken uh, only literally, the start from right view or right understanding and concluding with right meditation is probably the ideal progression common for many people striving to attain enlightenment. According to Wapola um, Sir Rahuna, there are two types of understanding. Uh, what we generally call uh, understanding is knowledge and accumulated memory, uh, an intellectual grasping of a subject according to certain given data. But then there is a real deep understanding that is seeing a thing in its true nature without label and name. Uh, 
Uh, and this is possible only when the mind is free of all impurities and is fully developed through meditation, he shares. And thus, uh, I think as we're all familiar with, we find uh, many Buddhist traditions uh, focusing on the Eightfold Path uh, as a way to attain enlightenment. Uh, what is very apparent uh, is that the focus is on an individual's <coughs> attempt to rid oneself of pressure or impurities mentioned in the above quote and attain nirvana through the practice of the Eightfold Path. The Mahayana attempt in um, trying to make more apparent the relationship between self and others in regard to religious practice uh, results in a shift or transition to what is known as the, the Paramitas. Uh, the Mahayana attempt to fully bring out the, the religious practice is not only an individual matter focused on the individual, but must necessarily also include others. Um, one uh, Buddhist leader shares that the uh, paramita means transcendent action, uh, actions or an attitude which uh, is performed in a non-egocentric manner. We conduct our lives and perceive the world either in an egocentric or non-egocentric way. The paramitas are concerned with the effort to step out of the egocentric mentality. Um, Reverend Henry uh, Adams, uh, a Jogo Shinshu minister uh, on the mainland, uh, explains that the Mahayana tradition places a strong emphasis on benefiting others as part of Buddhist practice. As an expression of this uh, attitude toward the nature of Buddhist practice, the Mahayana tradition emphasizes the essential elements of Buddhist practice described in the Eightfold Path in an alternative, alternative model called the Six Paramitas. The Six Paramitas uh, encompass the virtues of the Eightfold Path while emphasizing benefit for others through the addition of dhamma, the generosity or self is given as the first virtue. Wisdom, the final element of the Six Paramitas, implying that the benefit to self of receiving wisdom comes through the practice of benefiting others. Thus, in uh, Mahayana, the aspirant point, like in the, the Bodhisattva, embarks with these two things in mind. Uh, and in the Mahayana tradition, uh, the six paramitas uh, explicitly shows the relationship, again, of self and others in regards to enlightenment. Um, um, to summarize uh, the relationship between wisdom and compassion, um, of course, these two aspects are always uh, found together. Uh, and um, I would uh, express it as uh, that wisdom guides how compassion unfolds and compassion fulfills wisdom. That the two are always a pair and go hand in hand. Um, for Japanese Buddhism, uh, out of the eclectic Tendai and the esoteric Shingong of an earlier period, during the Kamakura period, uh, some of the major religious figures uh, begin um, espousing or focusing on one practice or a single practice. Uh, and thus we have the, the Zen denominations uh, uh, with meditation, the Nichiren denominations with uh, reciting the name of the Lotus Sutra, and of course the Pure Line traditions of, to which I belong, uh, reciting the Nembutsu. And these kind of become the central practice, if you will, uh, of, of the various uh, denominations. Um, another aspect of uh, Buddhism which uh, I <coughs> need to mention uh, is uh, merit transference. Uh, I think uh, many of you are familiar with that. And basically, it's sharing or transferring merit that one has accumulated uh, uh, with others. Uh, but there are many, many, I guess, ways or uh, um, to whom the merit is shared can vary. <coughs> uh, and uh, it could be to another individual, it could be towards brotherhood or enlightenment. Uh, many times the deceased, uh, birth in the pure land of uh, Amida Buddha, or and all sentient beings. And in most cases, uh, it's the individual who is practicing which transfers uh, the merits or, uh, to someone or, or, or something else. Uh, but in Jodo uh, Shinshu or 
Caroline tradition, uh, that there is a, a, a kind of maybe unique understanding uh, which I'll get to uh, in, in a moment. Um, however, another view which I need to introduce to understand the Mahayana Pure Land tradition uh, is what is known as the three Dharma ages. Uh, and that uh, time is uh, divided into uh, three time periods. Uh, one is the, the right Dharma age, uh, and then there is the semblance Dharma age, and then there is the last Dharma age. Uh, currently, uh, uh, according to uh, most uh, Japanese denominations, we're in the current uh, last Dharma age. And uh, what, what does this have to do with enlightenment uh, is that um, it said that in the first Dharma age, uh, there is the teaching, and there are people who successfully do the practices, and then there is the attainment of enlightenment by those individuals. Uh, in the sentless uh, Dharma age, uh, it is said that the teachings exist, and there are people practicing, but the attainment of enlightenment uh, is not possible. Uh, and then there's the last third Dharma age in which only the teachings are said to exist. Uh, and so um, the Mahayana Pure Land tradition in Japan especially um, um, uh, sees that our world right now is uh, such a time so far removed from the historic Buddha and the Buddha's influence that uh, attainment uh, of enlightenment uh, is uh, not possible in this samsaric world. Uh, but does that, that mean that then we're all lost uh, until uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva appears again some five billion years later? Um, <laughs> according to the Pure Land tradition, uh, no, there is another way, and that is to be born or attain birth in one of the Pure Lands of the many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that Mahayana also speaks of. Um, I think over the course of history, the most uh, well-known has become that of uh, Amitabha Amitayus Sukhavati, um, the Pure Land, or um, Jodo in Japanese. And um, there are ways to attain birth into that realm. Uh, some are focused on um, performing a myriad of Buddhist practices. Uh, like the six parameters and so forth. Uh, another attempt is uh, what we refer to as Nembutsu, which can be either content, visual contemplation uh, of Amida Buddha and the Buddha's pure land, or reciting uh, the name of uh, Amitabha, Amitayus, Amida Buddha. Um, I belong to a tradition uh, which uh, uh, focuses on verbal Nembutsu, in that it's reciting. Uh, the name of uh, Amitabha Amitayus. Um, and thus, uh, the Pure Land tradition uh, uh, to, uh, to which uh, I belong um, regards uh, the reciting of Namo Amida Butsu uh, as uh, the selected practice, uh, that that is uh, the practice, uh, the way to attain birth uh, in the Pure Land. Um, However, in the 12th, 13th century, uh, there appeared a priest by the name of Shindam, uh, who, uh, uh, through his experience, uh, shared that uh, this recitation of uh, the Buddha's name, Namo Amida Butsu, uh, that, that uh, it's uh, not his own effort uh, in, in, uh, that uh, causes him to recite the name, that uh, it's not a uh, self power, um, what we would call a self power effort to attain enlightenment. But he shares that uh, his even being able to say Namo Amida Butsu uh, is possible because the Buddha is reaching out to him. And the Buddha causes him to awaken uh, to great wisdom and compassion and, and promises to embrace him and lead him to enlightenment. And plus, uh, now out of this awareness and gratitude, he recites Namo Amida Butsu. Um, and thus, uh, in this respect, uh, what happens is now there is a shift from uh, an individual I uh, practicing and doing a merit transference to share with others, where in Shinran's experience now, it is the Buddha which does the merit transference. Yeah. The Buddha directs all the virtues and merits that the Buddha uh, Amitabha Amitayus had accumulated 
with all other sentient beings. And so uh, this is what uh, is referred to as the great practice uh, in Jodo uh, Shinsho, the Shin Buddhist tradition, which uh, again uh, we share in uh, the great virtues and merits of this Buddha named Amitabha Amitayus. And the way the Buddha shares the merits is through uh, the name Namo Amida Butsu. Um, the name Namo Amida Butsu is uh, the Buddha's name that calls that is calling out to all of us, and at the same time, it's the name that we call <laughs> and get awareness and joyous gratitude of, of this uh, great wisdom and compassion, which uh, unconditionally is promising us uh, enlightenment. And, um, <clears throat> uh, and thus, uh, in uh, the Mahayana tradition, uh, uh, again, especially the Jodo Shinshu tradition, uh, there is this uh, uh, the shift in uh, where it is now uh, the, the Buddha uh, himself or herself uh, that is uh, again sharing enlightenment merits with all of us so we can attain enlightenment as well. Uh, the Buddha Amitabha Amitius realized through great wisdom that not everyone is able to successfully accomplish uh, the Noble Eightfold Path of the Six Paramitas. Uh, though we may try, as was Shinran's experience. And so instead, now great wisdom and compassion uh, reaches out uh, to share uh, this merit with, uh, uh, with all of us. And uh, I'll conclude by saying that uh, uh, in the Shin tradition, it is uh, after my physical passing, of, or when I shed this physical body, that uh, I'm able to attain perfect enlightenment. Right now, I'm just uh, an ordinary foolish being still plagued by my klesha <laughs> on a daily basis, even to a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Uh, but uh, uh, what happens uh, until I attain birth in the pure land at the end of my life um, is that my life as a Shin Buddhist is one in responding in gratitude to the unconditional compassion of the Buddha. Uh, and this is where, for me, in a way, the Eightfold Path and things that uh, come back into the picture, so to speak, uh, as uh, references or guidelines on how to live a life which will hopefully lessen suffering and sorrow in the world. Uh, and so, uh, again, the life of a Shin Buddhist right now to me is a life of responding in gratitude to great wisdom and compassion. Thank you. Well, I see that the practice of Nembutsu uh, provides a great talent for timing. <laughs> I think that just time. One of my roles is to keep track of time, so I, I will put this ring here and it will remain us, remind us that uh, we need to keep about 15 minutes for each presenter. Um, the second speaker tonight is Roshi Michael Kieran, um, who is also a well-known local teacher. Um, in the profile description that you have, I didn't see anything about Diamond Song. I did the uh, you know, word that is not used anymore. I mean, it, it, it men mentions the Palo Rosa Center, uh, but not Diamond the, Sangha. Is this the, it is the Diamond Sangha. And yes, the, right. the Palo Rosa Center is the place. All right, yeah. yes. So for those of you who are familiar with the place, that at the top of Palo Valley, you have this wonderful temple uh, where um, this unique tradition of Zen uh, is being taught. And Roshi Michael Kieran um, has been uh, has received the Dharma transmission in 2004 uh, and is the current um, teacher in charge of leading the committee. So uh, please welcome uh, Roshi Michael Kieran. <laughs> See if I can do this with hands free. <laughs> Looks like it. In reflecting on our topic tonight, I, I thought I would talk about some of the uh, ways that Zen, uh, maybe through its origins in China, um, brought something unique to the understanding of the Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, Zen developed in China 500 years after Buddhism arrived. So there was a long period there of mixing with native wisdom traditions in China 
of Taoism and Confucianism. And those are thoroughly mixed in to Zen um, and affect the way Zen uh, presents itself and presents the Buddhist teachings and conveys those teachings. The, the way they are expressed in Zen and the way they are taught and conveyed and the methods of teaching. We might say that a primary focus of Zen is the eighth fold of the Noble Eightfold Path, Right Samadhi. This is sometimes translated as Right Concentration. Um, I think there are some problems with that translation, but there you have it. I, I like to leave it untranslated as Samadhi. Uh, Right Samadhi is often explained in terms of aspects of deep meditative absorption called jhana in Indian Buddhism. The, when Buddhism went to China, the term jhana uh, was transliterated into Chinese as chan na, or sometimes shortened to chan. Uh, when Buddhism went to Japan, Chan became Zen. I'm not sure quite how that worked, but uh, Jhana and Chan seem pretty close. But anyway, there you have it. Uh, so the very name of our tradition comes out of the eighth fold of the eightfold path, right? Samadhi. And Zen went on to develop, and it's really unique way, uh, its own flavor, its own expressions of the Buddha's teachings, and its own ways of uh, transmitting those. What I'd like to do this evening is touch on two factors that are maybe unique to Zen in some way, uh, in terms of Zen's contribution to Buddhism and the teaching of the Buddha way. The first of these is the idea of the path itself. Uh, Chinese were long familiar with the idea of the Tao. And when Buddhism came to China, uh, it became the Buddha Tao, the way of the Buddha. Uh, and, and with that came a kind of understanding of, of the way, not simply as the way to a goal, but as the goal itself to find accord with this way of living, with this way that the universe is unfolding. So I want to read you the very first chapter of the Tao Te Ching. It, it gives us a sense of some of this uh, understanding of the Buddha way that, that is just internally part of Zen without being made explicit usually. The, Translation I'm going to read of that first chapter, by the way, is from retired UH professor Roger Ames and his late great colleague, David Hall, um, a wonderful, uh, both of them wonderful scholars on uh, Taoism. It's not the most poetic translation, but it's one of the best I know in terms of conveying accurately the subtle sensibilities of this ancient text, the Tao Te Ching. So, in fact, this is just part of the first chapter. It says, waymaking that can be put into words is not really waymaking. And naming that can assign fixed reference to things is not really naming. The nameless is the fetal beginnings of everything that is happening, while that which is named is their mother. So here we find right off the bat that we, what we often think of as a noun, as the way or the path, is really a verb. Tao means not the path as a thing out there, but to create the path to make the path, and that is part of Zen teaching. 
This is not to say that there is no path, no Buddha way, but simply that the path is made in the walking of it. It's not outside of ourselves. It's not outside of our own practicing. So this becomes a very fundamental understanding in Zen Buddhism of the Buddha way. Where is it in your own footsteps? Our Zen ancestors are very insistent about this. I'll share with you another passage from the great Zen master Rinji, or Rinzai in Sino-Japanese. You'll maybe appreciate this same point about the way. Linji said, when students today fail to make progress, where is the fault? The fault lies in the fact that they don't have faith in themselves. If you don't have faith in yourself, then you'll forever be in a hurry trying to keep up with everything around you. You'll be twisted and turned by whatever environment you're in, <clears throat> and you can never move freely. But if you can just stop this mind that goes rushing around moment by moment, looking for something, then you'll be no different from the Buddhas and ancestors. So, um, this is a very Zen understanding of the Buddha way. Uh, not something out there that I have to conform to, but something that can be discovered in my very own breath, in my very own steps, in my, my very own thoughts. As I mentioned earlier, the sense um, in, in this in this way, we, we can begin to see that the, the practice of the Buddha way is not just a practice to get to something else. The practice itself is it, is the goal. Here's another great uh, Zen master, the Song period master Yuanwu, speaking about this matter. He said, originally, the way is wordless. Sounds like Taoism. Originally, the way is wordless. With words, we illustrate the way. Once you see the way, the words can be immediately forgotten. To get to this point, you must first go back to your original state. This is the single track of the great road to the capital. When you reach here, as you raise your feet and put them down, there's nothing that is not this great way. Nevertheless, this is unavoidably difficult to realize and practice. But there you have it, in your own footsteps. The great way is well and alive. Uh, this same idea uh, takes shape in the teachings of Dogen Zenji with the sense that practice is not practice to gain enlightenment, but it is practice grounded in enlightenment, permeated by enlightenment. <laughs> Every breath of practice. Um, sometimes I've, I've heard the uh, expression in, uh, from Zen teachers saying, uh, one stick of incense, one stick Buddha. So the idea there being that if you're sitting zazen, uh, as one stick of incense burns down, that's one one length of Buddha in content. So again, the same idea of, of the way itself, uh, practice being uh, the goal itself, not something beyond that. Um, the second point I want to touch on that uh, I think has some, uh, inherits some useful ideas that, that is about the, the Eightfold Path is the sense of right. Um, each of the uh, aspects of the Eightfold Path 
uh, is begins with the word, usually in our, most English translations, the word right. Um, sama, I believe, is the word in Pali. Uh, and there's a Zen understanding of that uh, right, uh, I think, have been influenced by Confucianism in a, in a very useful way. So that's I want to talk about that a little bit. First, beginning with the, uh, the meaning of the Pali word sama, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I think some of you would know better than I. Um, in, in Pali, the word means right or correct, but as I understand it, it comes from a Vedic term, which means connected or as one. So that's that's pretty interesting. Um, it's not right as in some abstract ideal of right, but having to do with connection. The term uh, when Buddhism went to China, this term sama uh, was translated using the Chinese word zheng, which usually means correct or proper. Um, it's an interesting term. We don't have a, well, we do have a blackboard. Um, and I can, we have, I'll, I'll, I'll write it with my chalk. So it's like this. It has an upright part to it, and then a line at the top of the line here, a line at the bottom. Um, that's part of part of the sense of it is upright, something that that will bear weight, that, that will stand up on its own. Um, in contrast to something that's slanted or biased, which will collapse when uh, when viewed from a different direction or um, when it's time to follow through. Uh, so I think this is a very interesting part of, of what this matter of right is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood. What is the right part that's really important? Um, Sometimes people want to know, how do I know if, if I'm right or not, or if I'm doing it right? Uh, you don't know. It doesn't work like that. There, it, it's not a matter, at least in Zen teachings, of aligning with some abstract ideal. The, the, what is right or correct? is correct in the specific situation that arises. And um, so I've got two minutes. Um, that's important. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's arbitrary or wishy-washy or relative. The standard for rightness is the particular situation itself. And that particular situation is very particular and very exacting and demands a response that is appropriate in that situation. If we try to overlay the situation with our ideas of what is right, um, we're usually in trouble. And the words that come out of our mouth or the actions end up not being upright. They don't hold up because they don't work for everyone. They don't come from the situation itself. They come from some other idea or place. So um, in Confucianism, this is a very important aspect to, um, to be responsive in each situation um, and to be able to respond appropriately to, to what arises. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, uh, I don't want to consume too much of our precious time, uh, but our next speaker is Dr. Dean Nelson, um, who is trained in Tibetan Buddhism, 
he practiced at Naropa Institute with Chogyal and Tongbai Kuche, and then founded the Kailua Shambhala Meditation Center in 1996, and has been uh, teaching mindfulness meditation in several institutions. Uh, he is also a licensed uh, chiropractor, acupuncturist, and author of the book Don't Waste Pain. Without further ado, I have a, a relatively soft voice. Can, can you hear me okay? Huh? We're okay. <clears throat> We're good to go. Well, uh, did you start with timer? <laughs> Uh, I guess a few seconds to cheat here. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Hawaii Alliance of International Buddhists for um, organizing this panel. And uh, it seems like whenever I'm at a place where a lot of good things are happening, I, I usually see uh, Tan leading it and Quinn also. So I really want to give a shout out and a mahalo to their kind of endless Bodhisattva activity. If you've been in the Buddhist scene, you know these guys are always front line. Apropos of that, when the heavy lifting seems to be needed to be done, the little lady in back, Marjorie Hamai, always also seems to be there either parking cars or just doing incredible organizations uh, feeds. So I wish to thank you very much and, uh, all, and all of you for coming. Um, <clears throat> it's a particular thrill to be able um, to meet uh, Bishop and uh, to be in a panel with uh, some gentlemen that I've known very well or consider Dharma brothers and it's just a thrill to be here. Uh, Tonaby, the 19th century French historian, was said to have said that the, uh, one of the great historical facts of the, of the 19th century would be that the coming of Buddhism to the West. I guess the reason I mention that is I feel like I'm very much sitting in this room looking out at all of you, uh, a part of that experiment, this wondrous, uh, profound teachings that's coming to our uh, culture, and how that blend, as Michael uh, pointed out, it, it sometimes can take 100 or 200 or, as he pointed out, 500 years for this meeting of this profound teaching to integrate and come into the uh, actual culture. So here we are, all a part of this just extraordinary experiment. Um, <clears throat> I th was rather intimidated by talking about eight rights. First of all, when I took eight rights, I always ended up back where I was. So I'm going to just take one right and extract it and talk about it from three points of view or the, how I was trained, you know, which is sometimes called the fundamental teachings or uh, Yana, fundamental vehicle, the great vehicle, which Eric, he said it was okay to use that name, uh, the Mahayana, the great vehicle, and finally the uh, Vajrayana vehicle, the vehicle that deals with both energy inside the body and in the phenomenal world altogether. <clears throat> so, because I'm not particularly, I'm slightly um, speech challenged, I thought I would take on the challenge of, of talking about right speech. I both have a tin ear, and as I get older, it seems I've put more marbles in my mouth, and that it's harder for me to enunciate, but I will do my best, so I will talk about right speech. Trumpa Rinpoche, who certainly was the main teacher in my life, once said, <laughs> he said, when the Martians come to Earth, they're going to look at us, and they're going to think our whole lives about this one orifice called our mouth. He says, they're just going to be stunned. He says, you should see. He says, from their point of view, they're going to say, you can't believe they throw things in their mouth, and they eat, and they chew, and they spit things out, and they're always doing something with their mouth. They go, yeah, 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 and every once in a while, they do something so stunning with their mouths. It's so beautiful. They sing. They make these songs. And he says, really, in general, he says, the Martians, they're going to say our, our life is about the orifice called our mouths. So I thought I'd talk about speech. Before I go into that actual discussion, I wanted to do a not paid for uh, a personal advertisement for Buddhism. 
So this is a not-for-profit advertisement, you could say. And I, I hope it, the only reason I would say is I hope in some ways it, it's true for you or it's stunning or in some way it means something to you. Of all the blessings, <clears throat> of which it, it takes both fingers and toes to count in my life, there is no question that on my deathbed I will say hearing the Buddha Dharma was the most important thing that happened to me in my life. It is a peerless jewel that gave my life meaning, that literally changed my life, and I don't think it's hyperboiled to say that it may have saved my life. So I just wanted to say how lucky I feel all of us are to have been exposed to the Buddha Dharma, the Dharma of the teachings. Of Buddha, the Dharma of awake. Uh, apropos of that, uh, there is a, before I talk about speech, I want to talk about speech, as I said, from three points of view. The first one, the fundamental point of view, uh, our basic training, uh, at least three of us, and I just found out from uh, the bishop his own training, go back to a technique itself called shamatha or vipassana or mindfulness. We have a baseline practice that we know that we go to that informs us of how to proceed on the path. I can't even begin to tell you how important, in other words, the actual practice of mindfulness itself is, is considered so fundamental to the understanding of the Dharma altogether. So I'll speak about the fundamental practices of speech, and then I'd like to move on to the Mahayana practices of speech. And the Mahayana practices of speech have to do with how to create community, how to learn to be kind, how to uplift and create a sangha of gentle, we call warriors, gentle awake people, how speech is actually uh, integrated to do those things. And finally, I want to speak about speech from a Vajrayana point of view or a tantric point of view, which is kind of the magic point of view that has always been or is talked about frequently. In the beginning, there is a word it was said in a book that we all are familiar with called the Bible. And then there's a sense that from the undefined and the magical and the, the sacred, through the communication of speech, comes sensibilities and a penetration of wisdom into our own being. So that's the Vajrayana point of view of speech. Um, <clears throat> I came to Buddhism in a, a rather uh, convoluted path. I'm a Norwegian, uh, I was born in Lake Wobegon, a Norwegian bachelor farmer. And uh, I brought a lot of questions to my uh, fellow Norwegians at that point. I, I guess you could say I was a rascal. I was somewhat uh, angry. I certainly was confused. I certainly felt like I wasn't given the whole picture of what life was about. And when I asked uh, <clears throat> my spiritual mentors at that time, I was told that actually it was kind of a don't ask, don't tell on a very pervasive cultural level. That it wasn't that the questions I had somehow about why was I so frustrated, what was anger, what was prejudice, what was this incessant noise in my head about, what what was going on? I found that I couldn't get those answers. And so when I heard the word Buddha and I heard the word fearless, I heard the word fear, and I heard the word compassion, and I heard the word empathy, and I heard the word training, and I heard the word egolessness, and I heard the word emptiness, and I heard the word karuna. I was like dancing for somehow my life now could possibly make sense. So all that was in a way of some sort of small advertisement for the Dharma altogether. There was a, uh, one time in 1979, once upon a time, in 1979, in Chateau Lake Louise, we had taken over the entire hotel for a three month <coughs> training with intense meditation practice and study. At that time, Chogun Trumper Rinpoche asked a very wonderful question. He said, when was the first time that you heard the word Buddha? When was the first time that you heard the word awake? 
And he said, and watch what happened after you heard that word. Trace that word, he said. He said, this little coincidence happened, that reading happened, that teaching happened, that relationship happened, that invitation happened. He said, if you actually watch this process, he says, since you've heard that word awake, you've been coming to be trained more. You've been coming to actually have your questions to really dive into the Buddhist teachings. So it was one word that actually started all this, and he really beautifully said, trace this down, these little coincidences in your life. Chogun Trungpa Rinpoche was an extraordinary lover of words. Um, although English was his third language, his vocabulary was much faster than mine, and he could make jokes about Mickey Mouse to Superman, and throw in more colloquialisms than I could even understand. I'm still trying to understand some of the etymologies of how he used the English language. So again, in some sense, by way of introductions, I'm now going to talk about speech from the Hinayana or the fundamental point of view. So Trungpa Rinpoche used to love to turn up the heat. I guess you could say it. So after the mindfulness training, the actual formal training of meditation, which you could say is a training of how to be at peace and in the present right now, as Michael has referred to, right now. After the formal training of learning how to train your mind to make friends with yourself, he then turned up and said, in post-meditation, I want to see how, I want you to watch how you speak. In, the, in how he uh, was at, in his lifestyle, in his life rather, he went to Oxford. He got invited to Oxford and he went to Oxford. So he became very acutely aware of how the English language was spoken. And he loved the English speaking English. And I think he was shocked at how he spoke English. So he actually created six rules of speech for us to take with us and to start being aware of. So he, in a sense, you could say he created a kind of claustrophobia. You did the meditation practice, and then afterwards you had to watch how you were speaking so that you could also keep training your mind, keep opening your heart, you could say. So I'm going to go over these because somehow they seem so pertinent. The first thing that he asked us to do was to, here I'm shuffling, right? Was something I probably, again, please forgive me, I, I feel like I picked this to embarrass myself, but the first thing he asked us to do was to speak slowly. So we're talking about training now. How do you actually train yourself? So to speak slowly. So often it seems like we're just in a, almost a machine gun hurry to get whatever's on our mind out. So he said, listen, slow down. Use speech slowly. So this was the first thing. These rules were actually on posted on the walls when we were at retreat. The second thing that he said was enunciate clearly. Again, I think uh, he, 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 on this one, he probably he created what was probably the most uncomfortable discipline of many many um, uh, uh, programs that he did to train us. He created elocution lessons. We actually had to go to elocution lessons, and he loved the Oxonian uh, dialect or uh, uh, pronunciation. So he made us speak these different. Uh, uh, sentences, yeah, it, it's funny now. Not funny. Now. I literally stayed outside the hotel in, in sub-zero weather in order to miss these meetings where we, where I could possibly corner to speak these uh, these elocution lessons. But this is how they went: how to speak the English language, how not to speak Americanism. <laughs> So again, he turned up the heat on us in terms of the post-meditation, to be aware of how we speak, to not be sloppy, that it actually mattered to the world what came out of this orifice. The third one was something that, uh, again, was uncomfortable to me say, which was listen to yourself. Listen to yourself speak. I don't know how often I just prattled. 
you come to mind. You know, and the, I think many of us are guilty. So he said, listen to how you speak. And then the harder one. Oh, no. OK, I'm going to hurry this up. Uh, let me see. How can I do this in two minutes? Listen to yourself. Listen to others. Regard silence as a part of speech and speak concisely. After this training of the fundamental training, the next thing we did was go back to 11th century book in terms of how to reduce slander, uh, idle gossip, wrong speech, and hurtful speech. Now, I'll cut to the chase on this one as I'm running out of time. I didn't do a very good with budgeting time. Is that a seven or a one? That's a, well, that's a seven. No. <laughs> Um, in terms of, of wrong speech, he says there's there's uh, many aspects of it, but you're starting to deal with lying, gossip, idle chatter, slander, and words that hurt. And the words that hurt were particularly possible uh, or painful to read. Uh, they have to do with words that are transmitted or outlined lies or speaking clandestine to people. I was so taken by it, I actually scanned the pages, sent it to the White House and the Congress and Fox News and CNN. And I am expecting a tweet as we speak from, from the mayor. But I won't hold my breath. The last aspect of speech that we were trained in, the Vajrayana, has to do with, you could say, the magical aspect of the speech. It's from the unknown, from the sacred, comes sound. And from that sound comes penetrating insight. Eric spoke about this, about actually saying the word Buddha, saying the word awake. And uh, one, these sometimes are known as mantras or seed syllables, these kind of magic sound. When you say the word aloha, you become partially aloha. It has power. When you say the word namaste, you are greeting the God in somebody. When you say the word awake, some part of you becomes awake. These seed syllables and bringing these power, these tremendously powerful words into play, pierce through your obscurations that Eric and Michael spoke of so beautifully, and instantly put, can put you into vast, vast mind. So that's the magical aspect of it. I'll finish up, and I thank you for not scolding me and reaching over. I wish to share a, a chant, which I know I share, I think, with all the traditions up here. It's probably a chant. It's from the Heart Sutra. Uh, if you know it, I would love if you would do it with me. It goes, Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Svaha. It translates, Om, gone, transcended, way transcended way far out there transcendent, awake, svaha. So with me, om gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi svaha. Mahalodhi. Thank you so much. Our first speaker is Dr. Gregory Pai, uh, who encompasses a wide range of meditation techniques since he has practiced meditation uh, in Tibetan, Zen, and Vipassana traditions. Uh, he currently teaches meditation at the Broken Ridge Korean Temple and at the Hawaii State Hospital. Uh, so we're going to please welcome Dr. Pai. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be here this evening uh, with you. And um, uh, like Dean, I'd like to express my gratitude to Tan Sun and the Hawaii Association for International Buddhists for sponsoring this wonderful occasion. Um, I don't think we ever expected to have such a great turnout this evening. So it's, it's a real testament, I think, to the power of the Dharma and the interest that the Dharma is generating you know, in our community. So I, I feel very privileged and very honored to be here at 
this evening. And also, uh, because of the honor to be sitting with uh, Michael Kieran, Dean Nelson, and Eric Bishop, Eric Matsumoto, uh, three Dharma brothers, or three people that I respect most highly in this community as far as teachers and progenitors and spreaders of the Dharma, you know, in our community. I, I have high respect for Michael and Dean and, and Bishop Matsumoto. It's, it's a real privilege to be sharing this, this podium with them this evening. Uh, it was interesting, you know, as I was thinking about this presentation, I was wondering um, how the order would be sort of structured. And um, so it went from Shin Buddhism to Zen to Tibetan, and now it's Theravada. Which was interesting because it's sort of going back chronologically in time. And in a sense, you know, I, I kind of had to remark to myself as I was following the proceedings, because in a way it, re it replicated my own process uh, as I was sort of familiarizing myself with the meditative traditions. I actually, and I have to, I have to say that I had the honor of studying with Chakyam Trumpa Rinpoche uh, back in the 70s. And I also was the teacher of Dean, and I also had the privilege of studying with uh, uh, Roshi uh, Robert Aiken, who was the teacher of Michael Karen uh, in the 80s. And so, uh, you know, it's uh, I, I feel a real brotherhood. You know, unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to practice Shin Buddhism, but uh, in terms of the meditative traditions, both in Zen and Tibetan, uh, they were part of my whole sort of development as I was learning about meditation. Of course, I eventually, my motivation actually as I went through these traditions was to go back in time, back to the original teachings, you know, the, the fundamental teachings. And so what the Buddha actually taught when he was alive, and what came down to us in the sutras, and what the recorded texts of the teachings of the Buddha, insofar as they accurately represented what he actually taught when he was alive. How it, how it has come down to us through the ages. And so what I'd like to do is just go back through the Eightfold Noble Path, go back to the Four Noble Truths out of which the Eightfold Noble Path emerged and try to sort of characterize it basically from a Theravada ter point of view, but you'll see it, it will encompass or it will have, it will have its sort of roots or you know, connections to what Bishop Matsumoto said, what Michael Karen said, and what Nelson also said. First of all, to begin with, let's start with the Four Noble Truths. Now, what are the Four Noble Truths? Okay, so the first Noble Truth is the, the reality of suffering in our lives, it's existential suffering, you know, that sense of discomfort, that sense of anxiety, ultimately the fear of death, the fear of impermanence, the fear of loss. Um, I think most of the people in this room are beyond 50 years old, um, so we all know, you know, the feeling of diminishing energy, diminishing resources, diminishing vitality as we begin to age and approach, you know, the end of our lives. I'm 72, and as I've gotten older, I've begun to appreciate this more and more in my life, as I'm sure every one of us here has also. The second noble truth is the cause of suffering, which is craving. It's commonly known as greed, hatred, and delusion. But it's stated as craving. Craving is the wanting of things to be a certain way, or hatred is the wanting things not to be a certain way. <laughs> so so we, we can compress it down to just craving. Craving for wanting something to be a certain way, or craving for wanting something not to be a certain way. Of course, the third noble truth opens the way by saying that there is a coming to the end of suffering. There is a path that leads to the end of suffering in this world. And the fourth noble truth is the path. That is the path leading to the end of suffering. And that is the eightfold noble path. So you see it's a kind of culmination of the Buddha's teaching in terms of his prescription for our ability or his pronouncement that we are actually able to attain the end of suffering in this life, which is, you know, powerful, just absolutely powerful, and just, you know, empowering to understand, to have a sense of that. 
Of course, the Eightfold Noble Path is right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort or energy, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Now, in order to remember this, I thought to myself, U-T-S-A-L-E-M-C, Utsalem. <laughs> That's how we remember it. So I just remember the word Utsalem. So if you ever want to try to remember what the Eightfold Noble Path is, just say Utsalem, U-T-S-A-L-E-M-E-N-C. Now, in the basic Theravada teaching, these eight factors are broken into three groups. Now, this is really, really important to understand. The three groups, the first is called the morality group, morality and ethics. So that's speech, action, and livelihood. This is how we behave in the world. This governs our everyday you know, behavior in the world. The second is called the concentration group. Now, this includes effort, mindfulness, and concentration. So these are the meditative you know, sort of factors. This is what we try to attain um, expertise in, attain ability in terms of the meditation practice. And the third is called the wisdom group. And that's understanding and thought. So there are three groups, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Now, these are regarded as training groups training groups. The Eightfold Path is basically a user's manual. I mean, think of it as a user's manual. It's like, a, you know, the, the, the manual to, you know, the way to awakening. So it's morality, concentration, and wisdom. These are the three sort of groupings of the factors. Now, the logic in this is that in order to attain wisdom, which is, you know, enlightenment, awakening, one needs to attain concentration, right? Because you have to attain deep concentration in order to attain insight or awakening. But in order to attain concentration, you have to live a moral life. Because concentration, the ability, the ability, the ability to meditate is based on a moral ethical life. Now, what that the, the, the sort of logic behind that is that morality, or morality and ethics, as defined by the five precepts, or the eight precepts, or the different ways that we define morality in the Buddhist context, is the foundation for the spiritual path. You cannot attain spiritual awakening unless you live a moral life. You know, as defined by the, say, the five precepts. You know, uh, not killing, not stealing, not speaking in truth, not uh, conducting sexual moral con uh, moral sexual conduct or taking substances that hinder the clarity of the mind. So by observing moral conduct, the purity of moral conduct, we attain clarity of mind. If we act in unethical or immoral ways, our minds become agitated and clouded by emotions. Right? I mean, if you do something naughty or unskillful. You know, you rob a bank, or you kill a person, or you, you know, commit fraud or embezzlement. You know, your mind is going to be pretty busy, right? It's not going to be able to sit down and have the clarity, you know, to meditate. Because the whole point of meditation is calming the mind, calming the thoughts, coming into silence of mind, quietude of mind. That's the whole point. So if you're living an immoral, unethical life, you're going to have a hard time doing that. So. There's a logic for this. So in order to even begin the practice, you have to live a moral, ethical life. So your mind is clear. You're not beclouded by emotions, remorse, guilt, anger, frustration, you know, all of the types of things that we that fill our minds pretty much 24-7. So in order once we have this moral ethical, ethical life, we can attain concentration and clarity of mind and ultimately the wisdom that comes from meditative insight as we deepen in our concentration practice. So the path of awakening begins with morality and ethics, which lead to meditative concentration, which ultimately lead to spiritual insight and awakening. Now the thing, so this is a, a very powerful sort of blueprint 
So you know, it gives us a kind of sort of broad understanding of how we go about this process of beginning to walk the spiritual path, beginning to learn how to meditate, and what the process of meditation you know, implies. But there's an, another aspect of this practice which sort of came to me as I was you know, studying and reflecting on, on the Buddhist teaching. That if you look at these three groups, particularly the last two, concentration and wisdom, they really function as a kind of metaphor for the actual spiritual process that Buddha went through himself in order to attain awakening. It's a very, very, of course, when you think about it, you know, the Buddha actually, you know, thought about the Eightfold Noble Path, right? And so if he came up with this idea, where, did, where would it have come from? Of course, it would have come from his own experience. So let's look at his experience okay, in terms of how that might have informed how he created the Eightfold Noble Path in the first place. So the concentration group, which is this large effort, mindfulness, and concentration, represents what in the meditative tradition is known as samatha, or concentration practice. That is what uh, Michael was referring to in terms of dhyana, you know, chan, that sort of the, the Zen practice, that practice of coming to samadhi or samatha. In Tibetan it's called shamatha. In Pali it's called samadhi or samatha practice. Now this is the tradition of meditation that the Buddha was trained in during his formative years when he first began his spiritual journey. He studied with Alara Kalama and Utaka Ramaputra, one of the greatest teachers at that time. So he, he attained the ultimate sort of level of meditative attainment under these traditions that he was actually offered you know, the leadership of these groups, but he declined. He decided to step away from it. And it was a form of meditation that he eventually abandoned as being inadequate for his ultimate goal of attaining freedom from suffering. And if you're familiar with the life of the Buddha, you know that he attained this great level of skill, but he decided that that was inadequate. He had to seek, search further. So he became an ascetic for a number of years. And prior, and, and it was during his period of asceticism when he decided that, you know, asceticism wasn't working for him either. And he decided to sit down on the banks of the Narajala River on the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya. And he said, I am not going to move from this place until I am awakened. And so he sat there for how many days, and finally enlightenment occurred. Now, so what happened to allow the Buddha to attain enlightenment? What is it that he did under that Bodhi tree that was different from what he was doing before? And that method of what he actually practiced under the Bodhi tree to awaken, to find awakening, is what became known as vipassana meditation or insight meditation. This is the form of meditation that has come down through us through history as what we know today as mindfulness practice. It was originally called vipassana. And in all the meditative traditions in Tibetan Buddhism, you have this distinction between shamatha and vipassana. So the question is, what is the relationship between these two? And you know, how does it work in our practice? But this, this vipassana, or this insight meditation, what we know as mindfulness, is the form of practice that the Buddha uniquely discovered as the means for awakening. And what it does is that it, it actually integrates shamatha into vipassana. They work together. It uses shamatha as its foundation. In other words, by attaining high levels of focused concentration, and focusing it on the content of his mind-body experience. So when you come into high levels of concentration, what you try to do is you try to dis quiet the discursive mind, the thought process in the mind. All the thoughts, you know, what you had for dinner, what what you what somebody said to you, you know, what you're gonna what you're gonna eat tomorrow, and all that sort of quieting the mind. And he's able, and by doing that, you're able to see the truth of your experience, unclouded by the obscurations of discursive thought. This is what mindfulness is. So the power in insight meditation lies 
It is capacity to allow ourselves to quiet our discursive thinking process and begin to observe our experience with a mind that's completely still, free of judgments, reactions, commentary, and comparison. It allows us to see our experience in a totally unique way that would be impossible unless we were in a state of focused concentration. In other words, it's a reality that we cannot experience unless we do meditation. In the Buddhist tradition, that is known as seeing things as they truly are, not through the lens of our subjective processing of our experience, but when that processing is set aside and we see things as they arise in our mind and body with a mind that's completely still. And this is the basis for the transformative insight that can lead to the end of suffering and the, alle and the allevi alleviation of afflictive emotions in our life. So this is the, 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 the golden path to awakening. Vipassana insight meditation that is built on the tradition of jhana or Zen or Bichan, you know, as we've come to know it through the history of Buddhism. Thanks to all the speakers for being so diligent. Uh, we have just a few minutes left and I would like to invite first uh, panelists to maybe try to uh, address what some of the, the common threads, because we have been exposed to such a wide range of traditions, it almost encompasses the, the non buddhist traditions. So one suggestion that was just made that was that Shamata Vibhashana could be one of the common uh, features shared by most Buddhist traditions, but I, I was wondering if there was any other um, comment by the other discussions, if you would like to add something about what is specific to, to a particular tradition or if there's any way you see uh, how Buddhists from different emanations and traditions to actually bridge the gap between the differences that separate them. You've mentioned initially Dr. Moore had mentioned initially a question of whether there's one Buddhism or, or many Buddhisms. Um, I, I think what we have is a family of Buddhisms. Um, as Westerners, we like to think that there's some essence that's the same that runs throughout, uh, you could say, Buddhism um, or other things like that, that that make them what they are. Uh, that's questionable, I would say. Um, and if there is if there is such a thing, uh, I would uh, suggest that it's probably unnameable and unidentifiable. Uh, because as soon as you identify it, you have uh, gone away from what what might be what the different traditions might actually have in common. The nameless. Uh, so that's one idea. I'd like to contribute to the conversation uh, by um, referring perhaps to what I many times use a diagram of a large tree to try to explain Buddhism. Um, there's an expression that there are 84,000 paths in Buddhism. And uh, you know each is uh, has a very specific and unique feature to it, uh, but uh, there are also common characteristics, I guess, that are common to the entire Buddhist tradition, um, which are uh, uh, selflessness, uh, the fact that all things change, uh, and that uh, there is um, of course suffering is a reality, and then I think maybe you can add a fourth perhaps characteristic that there is such a thing as nirvana. Enlightenment. And so um, I think generally there is an understanding that uh, any Buddhist tradition, if it's to be considered Buddhism, uh, contains at least three or possibly four aspects 
but uh, beyond that, that you know, there could be uh, again different paths to attain the same goal or summit. And so that's how I kind of see the Buddhist tradition uh, by looking at it in uh, this way. That there are commonalities and which are common to all traditions, and yet each tradition tries to offer something for different individuals because uh, in the Buddhist tradition we recognize that we all have different abilities and capabilities. And so Buddhism, I think, tries to find or what, give a path that is appropriate for you to reach a better path. Actually, the reality of the situation is that you have different traditions that have arisen at different points in history. Uh, the Theravadan tradition was 500 to you know, the, the turn of a millennium. Uh, Tibetan was perhaps what, uh, 1000 AD, 700, 800, 1000 AD. Zen was 14, 1200, 1400 AD, roughly. And Shin Buddhism was maybe 1400, 1500 AD. So each of these families arose, each of these groupings arose in different times in history in different sort of cultural contexts as a result of the different evolution, the evolution of Buddhism, or the understanding of Buddhism, and, and also the elucidation in the texts and the some commentaries and the you know the sort of academic erudite writings about the Buddhist teaching. So different points of view, sort of different emphases, you know, like the Mahayana tradition and the Theravada tradition, you know, began to arise. Uh, the Bodhisattva con you know, the concept, uh, compassion, karuna. So, um, but to me, and, and that's wonderful. This is, it shows the richness and the diversity, you know, the whole Buddhist heritage, you know, throughout history. But the one central question, the one central question that all of these, all of these approaches have to address is the reality of human suffering. You know, what is it to die? What is it to suffer, to have pain, to have afflictive emotions like fear, anger, stress, you know, envy, grief, remorse? What do these afflictive emotions mean? And what does this tradition do to help me face the vicissitudes of my own life? Whatever tradition you have, if you fulfill that mandate, you are alive. If you don't, you're not. Because you're not responding to the basic existential human question of what is life, what is the meaning of my life, and what is my purpose here on earth. That's what you have to do. However way you do it, it's OK. You know, we are a family. We're all brothers in the Dharma. But that's the central question. And how? Do you address it in ways that connect with people's hearts? You know, one of the big questions in Buddhism today is how, why are we losing our younger generation? Why are the young people not coming into Buddhism? And that's a really, really good question. You know, what is it that's not appealing to the young people that it's like the old people stuff? It's too intellectual, it's too conceptual, it's too ritual, it's too whatever, 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 whatever. But it's not telling me why I'm here and what the purpose of my life is. If there is a teaching that does that, that reaches to the heart and the fears and the aspirations of every person that has the wherewithal to ask that question, what is the meaning of my life? You have touched the heart that person. And that's to me the power of the Dharma. That is what the power of the Dharma is. And if it can be expressed, articulated, and conducted in a way to reach the hearts of the people who ask those questions, it can never die because it touches the essence of the human condition, which every one of us have in our hearts. Thank you so much. I don't know exactly how long we have. Is there a limit? We have or 10 more minutes. So 10 more minutes. Yeah. All right. So maybe we can um, open questions to the floor. Uh, if you could just stand up.
Unfortunately, we have only one mic, so you will have to speak really loud. And if you could say uh, you come who, up who is the speaker uh, you, to whom you want to ask a question, it would be very helpful. Okay, <laughs> of young people uh, in children's programs. And I think uh, part of it is there's not time to candy coat happiness. It's just the accessibility of the instantaneousness of the uplifted presence that I'm emphasizing over and over. So it isn't that suffering isn't there. It's just that on a moment to moment basis, it is absolutely impossible, even this second, to eradicate all the struggle that you have in your mind put a smile on your face and feel uplifted, even now, right now. It's always there. So I don't know that this, I'm reframing it as some sort of distant and hard struggle altogether, but emphasizing over and over in this moment, what's there? It comes back. I think you let us see a smile. It's joy. It's there. So I, I hope that in some ways uh, answers. That's how I'm teaching them, I think. Our own tradition is having a resurgence with the young, with young people. But I'm kind of, I'm not trying to turn around the four noble truths. But the truth also is, is that uh, contained within this amazing journey of being a human being is this instantaneous proclamation of ridiculous peace and happiness on the spot, right here. So uh, I'm emphasizing that part. One of the things I do is I teach meditation in the Hawaii State Hospital. And uh, you can't find a more difficult group to work with when you are sitting in front of 12 people who are staring at you with angry looks in their face saying, what the hell am I doing here and who are you? And so you're supposed to talk about meditation, and you're supposed to talk about you know whatever, you know, how do you teach meditation to things like this. But I find that what begins to really, really resonate, and people start to listen, they start to look at you, is when you start talking about, as you meditate, what you're trying to do is you're trying to quiet your discursive mind, working with your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, learning how to recognize them, learning how to let them go, coming to that place of peace and stillness within yourself. And within that space, within yourself, you find your true space of refuge, peace, joy, of happiness, and your basic goodness, your basic Buddha nature. This is the whole idea. You are basically good. You are basically kind. You are basically compassionate, loving, generous, and a wonderful, beautiful 
This is what pure nature is. This is bodhicitta. We understand bodhicitta. This is the part that gets obscured by all our thoughts, all our emotions, all the stuff that crowds our discursive mind. Thought and thinking are the blinders. That's the clouded stuff on the mirror that prevents you from seeing your true reflection in the mirror. It's all the stuff in our heads. So the purpose of meditation is to cut through all that stuff so you begin to see what's truly inside of yourself. And once you start to see what's inside of yourself, you begin to recognize your true inherent beauty, your Buddha nature. And this is the fundamental premise of Buddhism as opposed to Christianity, right? Which is just the opposite. And this is a very, very crucially important point. This is where it comes from. The suffering is just the obscurations of the mind. So we have to learn how to cut through the obscurations of the mind to come down to that central, beautiful place that lies within ourselves. And once we begin to know that, you are the most powerful person in the world. You have your feet on the ground, you know who you are, and you know where you're going. And this is a powerful, powerful message to anyone. If it works for the patients in the Hawaii State Hospital, it will work for anyone. So, but this, the point is, let's not get lost in the suffering. Let's get down to what the true essence of the message is, our essential Buddha nature. And once we begin to find that by cutting through all the stuff in our heads, that is the beginning of awakening. That is what awakening is, cutting through the obscuration of the discourse. Any other burning question? <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank you all for sharing your insights today and, and for dedicating your lives to sharing uh, the, the, the teachings that, that you've learned um, and being leaders in our community. My name is Eric. I work at the East West Center. and. Um, this is another nonprofit plug, but I thought people here might be interested to know that uh, our East West Center Gallery is opening an exhibition this Sunday um, about Bhutan. And uh, we've invited three monks to build the San Mandala in the gallery, which will uh, take about a week to create and uh, is an incredible process to, to watch uh, visual and spiritual. And I'm just learning more about it myself, but if anybody um, would like to come and observe. Uh, I, I brought a few flyers that are I think, near the, the door out front, and you can always ask me for more information. But the gallery is free and open to the public. Um, and again, the, the opening is, is this Sunday at 2 p.m. Is there an opening ceremony? There is a ritual purification ceremony that will be um, starting at 1 p.m. So it'll last about an hour. And then from 2 o'clock, they'll begin work on the mandala. Um, it's a long process, so uh, you know you're invited to come back. We have open viewing hours uh, every day of the week, uh, morning and, and in the evening. Um, I have a question. Yes. How old are you? Uh, I, just, I just turned 40 a couple months ago. Okay. So um, I am younger than 50, but middle <laughs> <laughs> age. And why would you? Why would? How did you Uh Well, I'm not a. I'm not a practicing Buddhist, um, uh, but my heritage is Chinese, so there's Confucianism and Buddhism. Um, but you want some to know practice what you're right? about? Uh, yes, um, for sure. And, uh, I've been interested in meditation, and um, I heard Reverend uh, Fisher Matsumoto um, speak a little bit at the um, Living Treasures of Hawaii event a couple weeks ago, um, and I attended George Kai's uh, New Year's. Um, uh, meditation teaching, I enjoyed that very much. Um, but yes, I, I'm very much just a student and very curious. I can't pretend that I understood everything that was said today, but uh, that was I'm curious. That was the word. Curious. Right. It's the curiosity that, that drives drives us all. Um, so yes, again, you're welcome to, to come to the gallery this Sunday and throughout the week. Thank you. 
Well, I guess it is about time to conclude our evening. Um, if you want to say some concluding words. Okay. People, um, if you mind staying for a few more minutes, because we, this is a rare opportunity to get so, you know, uh, prominent uh, speakers from foreign tradition. We, we, I think, if you don't mind staying for a few more minutes for some more questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question, actually. So uh, <laughs> the idea of uh, inviting you all to share is uh, how to apply the, uh, the Buddha's teaching of the uh, a formal path, now, not only in the formal practice, but how do you apply it in, informally in the daily life? So I'd like to hear a little bit on that aspect, which is in the flyer that was uh, left out, and just say the A formal path. My idea is just how to apply the A formal path formally in the formal practice. When a practice you do chanting or meditation, it may be a little bit different than how you apply it informally during daily life. So I'd like to hear from all each of you on, on that part, if you don't mind. Maybe we can start from Michael. The Noble Eightfold Path is our life. Um, I don't think of it as applying as being separate from my life. So to practice the, eight, no, the Noble Eightfold Path is to live my life in a way that is fulfilling and gratifying and it, I think the what what has come out I think for, for many of us is the essential need to be able to pay attention to uh, to be able to direct our attention to what it is that we want to pay attention to that seems to be part of what makes the right for each of the aspects of our lives. Um, I would add here, from my own perspective, that uh, I don't see the eight, eight folds, um, the eight aspects, as a linear progression of any kind. They are interdependent. They all depend on one another. And they all are unfolding simultaneously. So in other words, it's true, as Greg said, that our insight depends on living a moral life. But understanding what a moral life is depends on insight. That we can't really see um, what a moral life is without awakening. Um, or at least our understanding of that is enhanced by awakening. So all of these aspects work together. Our life is one life. It's not a matter of steps and stages. And uh, the Eightfold Path is a wonderful representation of, of our life and the, and the richness of it. But I would say that the, the element of, of attention, of clarity of mind, is critical. I believe even uh, in our Chin Buddhist Jogosinshi uh, tradition, uh, that there is uh, the realization of the importance of having, for example, right thought, right speech, right action, and how, uh, because uh, if uh, it's not, or I, mean, uh, I know there was a discussion about how to translate the word right or how to interpret that, that it's not right versus wrong, so to speak. Uh, but uh, I guess Shin Buddhism kind of maybe like it uses expression begins uh, when you hit the wall and realize how challenging, how difficult it is to live the Eightfold Path. And uh, this was the experience of Shin Nang and uh, many in our uh, Jodo Shin tradition where after hearing the teachings of the Buddha where they earnestly tried to live the Eightfold Path but found it and um, it was very challenging that uh, whatever they thought uh, sometimes even in moments of anger would say words that were harmful and hurtful and so forth. Um, and uh, there are those of us who live in this world who uh, may not be engaged in the so-called ideal profession as far as livelihood is concerned. Uh, uh, the Shin emphasis would be there is this Buddha name that we have on and use that uh, embraces uh, us uh, unconditionally uh, without judgment. 
just as we are, imperfection and all, and it's still from the same uh, enlightenment. And so uh, what happens in dynamics, uh, what happens is that part of that uh, uh, feeling of gratitude and uh, at love, and there's also lament in the way I am living my life uh, at this moment, which is the cause of suffering for myself and probably for others around me. But uh, out of, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that is this foolish being, Eric. Uh, but there is a great wisdom and compassion that is uh, embraces me just as I am. Uh, and uh, when I awaken to that, then I respond to that in gratitude by again, trying to live a life uh, which, again, I can go to things like the Eightfold Path, the Six Paramitas, as a reference, as a guide to, to living. Again, not as a requirement or a religious practice, but uh, again, uh, just as a grateful response, this great compassion. Uh, uh, and eventually, uh, I think I might be remembered during the period of time. I think it's wonderful to remember that uh, we're not trying to turn a carrot into a turnip or something. We're uh, talking about your own nature, actual nature. You're never that far away from your own nature. So if you say, why do you meditate? The only logical answer I can tell you is that so you can be happier, so you can relax and really, truly love your world. So if you do a formal meditation, you can say, as Greg said, we've all been saying somewhat, that we live in a kind of a haze, kind of level of stupidity that's got life, like we're rehearsing life, but we're not actually living it. It's like we're constantly one step ahead of it. But when you drop all that, because you've been trained to learn to drop all that, even in the second, if you do that right now, you drop all that. What is there? It's amazing upliftedness and beauty. So why do you meditate? You want to fall in love with your world. It's not really all that complicated. Why do you meditate? Because you want to fall in love with your world. You want to claim your own nature. It isn't that far away from you like a thousand years of practice or arduous thing. It's every second you can just put a smile on your face, and there is your nature. The practice is important because of the speed and how we've been fooled, the haze and trance that we live in. What's next? <laughs> Drop it. Put a smile on your face. Your nature's there. You're fundamentally pure. You're fundamentally awake. You're fundamentally Buddha. It isn't that far away from you. So that's, you say, love, the essence of this thing is love your life. It's pretty much as simple as that. Get to know your own mind, your own nature. Thanks for that question, Tom. That's a very powerful question because it really brings the teaching down into our everyday life. Um, I would, several points came to mind as I would have to say for morality, the importance of morality, the importance of moral and ethical behavior. Um, incidentally, I didn't mean, Michael, they didn't mean that it was strictly linear. It's definitely an interactive process. It's, you know, and it, it interacts as you evolve, and obviously the inside of complex morality, etc. But the whole issue of morality is the whole issue of karma understanding karma, because all our actions, all our thoughts, all our emotions have consequences. So morality and ethics is the foundation for understanding of consequences. Unskillful actions produce unskillful results. Skillful actions produce skillful results. And this is based in morality. So the fundamental lesson of morality is understanding the importance of karma, and how karma works in our life. And that is one of the fundamental concepts you know, in, in, in how we present in the world in terms of our spiritual evolution. Um, the other one which Michael touched upon, which I think is really, really important, and also uh, Dean, is um, coming into presence of mind, understanding the concept of presence of mind, um, and actually, you know, we talk about it as if it's some esoteric, difficult thing to attain. Actually, what it is is a flow state, a 
is a psychological term. It's called flow. Right? If you were watching the Olympics, you know, you know, these guys are coming up to these skiers and saying, so what were you thinking when you just went off the slope and did a triple somersault and landed on your feet? I don't know. My mind was blank. I wasn't thinking anything. I mean, if you were thinking something, you're in trouble, right? And it's the same thing if you're painting a painting or playing a piano concerto or looking at a beautiful sunset or listening to a beautiful piece of music and you're just caught up in the beauty, the aesthetic of the moment. That is a flow state. So it's a common human sort of condition that we can attain in our life. And that is that moment of presence you know, that the Dean is talking about. Just coming into contact with life, cutting through all the stuff that's in our head, and coming into presence of mind, the present moment, feeling the beauty, the beauty, the sublime beauty of just being completely, totally present. There's joy, there's happiness, there's bliss in that moment. So, and it can happen, it's just opening up to the beauty of life as it unfolds moment by moment. And this is something that we learn to train ourselves in as we do the meditative practice. Um, in the arts, dance, music, this is what it's all about, coming into that full state. So what, what, this, what this whole practice is, is really just kind of transforming this into meditation where we're working directly with our minds, directly with our thoughts, our feelings and emotions, and learning how to work through them learning how to work with them, learning how to understand them in terms of their karmic implications for our lives, and by coming to that level of understanding, learning how to release them so that they don't control our lives any longer. This is what liberation is. This is the process of liberation, working with our thoughts and emotions. This is what we begin to learn. It's, it's closely analogous to this whole sense of the flow state how to cultivate that full state in our minds, in our, in our lives, so that we live a life rich, precious, and beautiful every moment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on this positive note, we should probably conclude, but I'm sure that everyone here has got a sense that the full path is much more than just a list of prescriptive do's and don'ts. Uh, there's much more to it, and we just scratch the surface. Uh, but uh, all the insights that have been shared tonight uh, allow us to at least complicate a little bit the understanding of this. There's nothing prescriptive list of things that should be done. Um, and something is based on the understanding of what is skillful or unskillful as have been outlined rather than uh, just you uh, ask in a certain way. So on this, uh, I think we should probably part ways. Uh, thing, thank our uh, speakers once more. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, yeah, everyone. Um, and, uh, if you could, just for a moment, I would like to share with you, you know, this organization that, that we belong to is called Haver Hawaii Association of International Buddhists. And what we are, we, we are all Buddhists and we come from different traditions, so that's what we are. So I would uh, encourage you all to be part of us. You know, and you can support by you know, paying a ten dollars deal a year, but you don't have to as long as you willing to be on our mailing list so we can send you an email to notify you of some event like this, which we hope to happen more regularly. And then um, the next topic that we'd like to discuss is about the, you know, that great was someone mentioned earlier about young how to get young people to be um, interested in Buddhism and stay with Buddhism. And we would encourage the young people, anyone you know, under 50, probably young, so to, to come up with the next uh, 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 event, instead of a panel discussion, I would uh, uh, envision it as a round table discussion of young people, or uh, anyone who consider themselves young, young at heart, and uh, or anyone who would be interested in what Buddhism would be, you know, uh, attractive to, to the young people, even if you're not young, but you have your your sibling, your children that 
you, you would you know, wonder what Buddhism would be attracted to. So that the next one, we haven't scheduled one yet, but hopefully within the next few months. So please share uh, uh, if you know someone or yourself, and what is a good time, uh, yeah, not at the uh, final exact time. So we hope to attend the next uh, gathering. Uh, a round table discussion of young people to discuss about what makes uh, Buddhism uh, be attracted to young people. Yeah, so think about it and please uh, let us know by emailing me. My name is Tan, uh, currently the president of Ping, uh, tanhawaii at gmail.com or mindfulhawaii at gmail.com either way. And let us know if you're interested or you know someone who would be interested in joining the next uh, gathering, uh, roundtable discussion on youth, which to me it is the most important uh, topic that we need to, to talk about. And we hope you can join us in yeah, many other events. The, the most important event of Hain is the Lama Chaka Festival, which uh, usually happens around the end of September or early October of the year. Uh, we hope you can join us the next time. We have, again, usually have a panel discussion and a speaker and food and dance and music. So, again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And, and, uh, yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.